Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland PBS with host Ray Gildow. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents. Minnesota's state uh, fish is the walleye. And whenever we have a program about walleye, it has a, a very wide um, attendance, um, I think, of, of our shows because there's so many people who fish walleyes in Minnesota. And uh, it's just, there's so many interesting things developing. If you look at Mille Lacs Lake and the controversies that are there, and you look at a, a lot of the climate change issues and how it's affecting lakes, so it's always interesting to have people on the show who are experts in walleyes. And my guest today is an expert in walleyes. And it's Doug Schultz, who is the area fishery supervisor from the Walker area. Uh, and Leech Lake is under his supervision, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show, Doug. It's good to have you back on. You were on a couple years ago. Yeah, And uh, what's changing? And we're going to talk a little bit about Leech Lake. And then you are also the co-chair of the, a program on walleye stocking in Minnesota, is that correct? Yeah, our walleye technical committee, which is our internal group of, of walleye biologists. You know, most of us in Minnesota are walleye biologists to some extent. Um, and then we, you know, work on walleye specific issues around the state. So we'll talk about that a little yeah, bit Yeah, well, let, 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 and I, I, I suppose maybe sometimes I focus too much on Leech Lake because you also have other lakes in the area mm -hmm. besides Leech. Uh, you don't go to Winnie, that's in a different zone, Yep, right? that's Grand Rapids, but we have uh, Woman Lake, for example, a very prominent uh, walleye and smallmouth bass lake, uh, Ten Mile Lake, which is another very large and popular uh, body of water. Uh, you know, basically my work area is the southern two-thirds of Cass County, so roughly Bacchus, uh, a line from Bacchus and north is uh, mine and then uh, you get a little bit south of back as it transitions. So Pine Mountain areas. is in your Pine Mountain area too? Yeah, that's one of my more southern lakes. So yep. tell us a little bit about your background, Doug. Uh, I grew up in Alexandria or went to high school in Alexandria. Grew up on a dairy farm over there. Um, you know, grew up fishing and hunting uh, like a lot of folks in Minnesota did. Uh, Mom was actually uh, came from a resort background and uh, went to South Dakota State University for my bachelor's and uh, master's at Southern Illinois, worked on invasive Asian carp uh, while I was there. And then uh, bounced around a few times when I came to Minnesota, uh, came back to Minnesota after grad school and uh, landed in Walker in, in 2007 as a large lake biologist uh, on Leech. And I've been the area supervisor now since I think 2011. Oh, okay. So it's been a, a few years now. So you came in at the tail end of the controversy with sort of where the fishing was so tough on Leech Lake. Or yeah, it was, it was still pretty controversial those first, uh, you know, probably four years I was there. But, you know, the, the fishing had, had picked up uh, starting, I think, in 2007 and 2008 and 2009 and, and 2010 were pretty red hot uh, in terms of a walleye bite. And then we've really settled back down in, into our new normal, which has, you know, been pretty doggone good. So it, it's kind of interesting because I've fished that lake most of my life. And I remember the years when the lake supposedly collapsed mm -hmm. and we couldn't even catch a perch. I, I remember going out with my son-in-law and trolling with crawlers and we couldn't even catch a perch bite. But then a year or two later, man, we were catching perch, 11, 12, 13 inch perch. So yep. they were there. Yep. We just didn't figure out how to get them, I guess. And I, and I think I found that true as a guide that over the years sometimes uh, the DNR will give reports about a lake and they'll say the numbers of walleyes or bass aren't really good. And if anglers aren't catching them, they just don't believe that report. Mm -hmm. What causes those ups and downs in a lake typically? Well, uh, a couple of different moving parts to that question. The first one obviously is, is recruitment or the number of young fish uh, coming into the fishable population. They really don't count until they're big enough to catch, right? at least from a from a fishing perspective. So are you looking then at 12, 13 inch fish? Is that what you would count? Well, for, so for walleyes, they'd be roughly age two okay. is when they start uh, becoming fully recruited to the population. And depending on what part of the state you're in, southern half of the state, you're uh, you know, maybe going to be about 13 inches, age two. Uh, northern half of the state, uh, you know, roughly north of 210, 
Uh, age two is going to be closer to about 11, 12 inches as you move north. And um, so age three is when they really first start hitting the fishery in those northern lakes. Um, so the number of young fish um, entering the population, that's the first driver. Because if you don't have young fish entering the population, you're not going to have those fish available for anglers to catch. Uh, and then the second is, uh, uh, and, and keeping it very simple here, forage availability, particularly during the summer. If you have a really big uh, perch hatch, hatch, for example, that can really shut down a summer bite. And um, you know, it's, it's our job to make sure the fish are there. Uh, we can't control, uh, we cannot control the bite and we can't control a folks fish. And uh, so, you know, when you hit those tough conditions, you really got to, uh, you know, look at what you're doing and maybe consider doing something different and something you haven't done before. Uh, for example, changing the crankbaits, you know, in the evenings, uh, midsummer. A lot of times that can, that can be the trigger mm -hmm. to make something happen. Um, you know, it, it really forces you to get out of your element sometimes if you're not having success, but it, uh, it, do, it also forces you to become a better fisherman. Is the primary forage base on Leech Lake for walleyes, is it still perch? Yes. And, and yeah. how, how is the Cisco population on the lake? It, really good. Um, we have not had a, a summer kill for, right. boy, five, six years now. So the Cisco population has really rebounded nicely. Uh, saw a lot of one-year-olds out there uh, in the gillnet survey last, uh, back in September. So, uh, you know, that one's really plugging along fine, hanging right around seven, eight fish in net, which is, uh, this is the most sustained it's been, um, boy, going back to the 1990s. Wow, and it's so, very much weather related, very, isn't it? Very much dependent on summer kill. Yeah. Yep, if we don't have a summer kill, you know, they'll knock out a pretty good year class every once in a while and, and be able to persist. So, as uh, far as Cisco go, we're in a really good spot. But, you know, perch really are the mainstay in most of the lakes uh, in terms of forage base. Uh, the mainstay forage in most of the lakes in Minnesota. So, uh, you know, our management actions that affect perch uh, obviously will, will end up impacting the other predators in the system at some point. Do you feel on, on Leech Lake that uh, anglers affect the population very much? Of perch, we don't have enough evidence yet to uh, probably point that finger. Um, the, the walleye fry stocking we did back in the 2000s uh, where we were marking fry so we could estimate total fry density in the system during those years. There was a pretty strong negative relationship between total walleye fry density and the number of perch basically recruiting to the population four years later. So the higher the walleye fry density in a given year, again because we were artificially inflating it, they were just chewing those young year perch down. Oh. And so about four years later when they are reaching the fishery, there's not as many of them the there. The perch are down. Exactly. But this year, uh, you said that it looks like there was a real good perch hatch yep. this spring. Yep. Uh, so we, we do trawling, uh, which, which is basically like a big shrimp trawl that we drag on the bottom of the lake uh, for standardized uh, locations and, and duration. And uh, we saw the highest abundance that we've seen uh, for young year perch in the last five or six years. Wow. So a pretty good hatch of, of perch this year. Growth on them was phenomenal. Uh, that's some of the fastest growth we've ever seen. Really? Yeah, they, they must have come off at just the right time when the weather really straightened out and, and you know, had a, had a good summer. Um, so they're, they're looking very, very promising. And uh, we also ended up having a record walleye hatch this year too in our, our trawl catch rate of really? young year walleyes was the highest we've ever seen. Ever? Ever. Wow. Uh, really, it blew the old historical high out of the water. The old high was 500 and some an hour, and this was 775 an hour. Wow. So, uh, tremendous amount of young year walleyes out there. Growth suffered a little bit because of that. A lot of, you know, more Too mouths many. to feed. Mm -hmm. uh, so not, not a big surprise there, but it's predicted to be a, you know, above average at, at, at worst year class. And, you know, it could be a, a pretty big one. We'll so, see how so they persist. Two, three years down the road, it could be pretty, pretty yep. darn good. I know I had Mark Bacigalupi on here, the Brainerd Area supervi Fishery Supervisor, and he said they uh, measured a couple of muskies that they put in the Gull Lake last year, okay. and they doubled their length yep. this, in, this one, in one year because he thought the forage base in Gull was very similar. So that forage base has a lot to do with how fast these, these walleyes grow, doesn't it? Forage base is one of that. Uh, you know, density is another. Uh, you know, again, the more mouths you have to feed, the less there is to go around. So growth will end up suffering if there's, if there's too many mouths out there. Um, and then the other is just age. You know, young fish, 
uh, their goal is to get as big as they can, as fast as they can. Um, in, in doing so, you have more uh, forage options available because your mouth size is bigger, gape. Um, so the bigger you are, the, the easier it is to, to keep yourself full, right? And then the other is the bigger you are, the harder, harder it is that you're going to uh, be predated on by somebody bigger than you. So uh, growth is really key uh, in the first few years of life for, for any species. That's when the most, most of the growth occurs. And then as they hit sexual maturity, uh, so for walleyes we're talking you know, roughly age 2 to age 3 for males. Females are age 3 to age 4 typically. Um, that energy starts going into uh, reproduction and so growth rates will start slowing down. What are you seeing in leech with the smallmouth bass population? We're not seeing it in our gear yet. Um, historically, they've always been there, uh, kind of just that random occurrence in the background. Uh, we're not seeing them increase in, in our gear yet, but you know, anglers are telling us they're running into them more often. And I, I caught one last year uh, off of two points fishing for walleyes. So, you know, they're they're out there, and, and it's it's not going to surprise me if they take off. Um, you know, you mentioned climate change. You know, AIS is another one of those mm -hmm. uh, things that, that really changes the lake. Um, climate change is, is another one. And, um, you know, smallmouth in particular are expected to be one of the big winners uh, out of some of the change that is coming. Uh, we have zebra mussels in Leech Lake now. And um, they were, we, we, we found villagers uh, in 2016 for the first time. And then this uh, fall, uh, we had our first adults on a, on a boat that had been moored in the lake the past two summers. So uh, it, it, that was our first occurrence of adults. Obviously, they're going to have big impacts on water clarity. And smallmouth in particular seem to do very well when the water clears up. So, and that's, that's not just you know, what we've seen here in Minnesota. That's uh, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, you know, across the range, smallmouth do very well uh, as the water clears up. And, you know, that lends uh, also to the uh, uh, talk about changes in our walleye populations looking ahead. Um, again, as our water clears up and our summers also become a little bit warmer, the walleye uh, production is not as high with clearer water. And again, that's something we're seeing in, in multiple states, not mm -hmm. just in Minnesota. Uh, as, you know, we've, we've done a good job of cleaning up our, our uh, impacts around the lake. You know, septic systems have gotten cleaner. We're no longer straight pipe and effluent. Uh, and our water quality is coming back to probably what it used to be historically. And, um, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, walleye management is changing a little bit. It, it's, it's, we're not having the success, uh, you know, particularly with stocking that we used to in some of those cases. So. Uh, that's just a tidbit that I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll probably touch on in the future when we have more information. But, uh, you know, as lakes change, the, the fish populations in them are going to change with We've it. already seen that in the Brainerd area with mm -hmm. the clearing up of the lakes. It's made it a lot more difficult in the summer to fish walleyes, and it's made them go to different places than we used to see them. So, yep. yeah, it's an unfortunate evolution of what's going on. Um, what would you say would be the top three walleye lakes in your area, in your zone? Well, obviously Leech, and then, uh, you know, if we put that kind of in its own, own class, uh, the next three woman lake right now is absolutely cranking. Uh, that's one that, uh, you know, we did similar fry marking out there and uh, deliberately manipulated total fry density using what we were putting in. And what we found was, uh, again, that same thing we had talked about before, the higher the fry density, the slower the growth, and actually the worse uh, the recruitment was to the population a few years later. So we backed our fry stocking down uh, quite a bit out there, and it's really responded well. Is there any natural reproduction going on? In yeah, the there's always there some going on in the background, and it varies from very little to a lot. Okay. So uh, our new plan now with, with how we're stocking fry out there is really aiming for that midpoint on a consistent basis. So we're stocking 500 fry per little acre every year, and it's because of the egg take operation, it's always been annual stocking anyway, but the densities have been quite a bit higher, as much as 5,000 fry per little acre, so oh, 10 wow. times higher. Wow. And we were basically just swamping the system. So um, that 500 fry per little acre, uh, when we look at that as a function of recruitment of those year classes, that's really the sweet spot 
that we saw out there. So that's our, our aim point. And that way, if, if we have, with the exception of really high natural reproduction, if we have any of that moderate to, to below, we're really in a good spot as a whole. And it's been working well. We've um, just got a monster year class of one-year-olds out there right now, so in about two more years. Uh, so it's at about 2019, that one's really gonna turn on. What, and then what would you consider the probably the third best late? Uh, there's a handful of them, you know, 10 miles, one of them that's very consistent. Very clear lake. Yeah, very clear, deep, <clears throat> and, uh, but, you know, and, and that's one actually where walleye finkling stocking has worked better uh, than uh, anything else we've tried. Again, a little mm -hmm. bit of reproduction going on in the background, mm -hmm. but uh, not consistent. And, uh, you know, finkling stocking in that case has, has worked well. That's one of the lakes, and, and we'll get into this with the Accelerated Walleye Program, that's one of the lakes where we doubled the stocking rate of fingerlings uh, because fingerlings were already working, so more fingerlings might work better, right? That's that's what a lot of AWP was. Um, double the rate of fingerlings and, and, you know, let that run for about 10, 12 years, and it just didn't move the needle. So went back down to our, our uh, traditional uh, one pound uh, every other year rate and, uh, you know, expect that one to just keep clicking along. So do you survey all these lakes every fall in your area? Oh, not even close. So you just kind of a rotation? Yeah, le leech is annual. Uh, woman has been annual because of the fry study. We're going to go to every other year, uh, I think, after next year on that one. And then the rest are on a roughly a three- to five-year rotation, three to six years. And then uh, that, that, that's on the walleye lakes. And then we have a bunch of bass panfish lakes that we just don't get into uh, very often, you know, the 200, 300-acre lakes. Uh, yeah. You know, we'd like to be in there more, but there's just not, uh, not resources, not enough time, and, and not enough bodies. Yep. How about um, um, when you look at the uh, muskie populations? Are, are you doing most of that survey stuff in the spring? Mm -hmm. and, and what are you finding on Leech Lake with the muskie population? Well, that's one we can't survey effectively. <coughs> uh, a couple of reasons. One is it's 112,000 acres, and it takes a lot more bodies than we have. Uh, two is uh, the exposure to the wind. Uh, in a lot of cases, we'd run into what we, we would expect to run into problems with nets getting rolled, and you know you end up with mortality issues then when that happens. And then the third one is a lot of the, and probably the most limiting factor is a lot of the spawning habitat is actually offshore. So leech, as you know, has those big, long, sloping flats in a lot of places, and a lot of the spawning habitat is in fact on those. Well, we only have 100 foot leads on our nets. And in some cases, we're a quarter mile offshore is where the muskies are actually at. We just can't get to them effectively. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's one we just, it, it's always on our wish list of things we'd like to do, but we logistically, we just can't come up with a good way it's to like do it. It's like going out on 112,000 acres to find a deer. They're just moving all over. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, <laughs> we got a pretty good idea of where to look. It's just being able to get your hands on enough of them uh, to make it informative. That's, that's the biggest limitation. Uh, we did do egg take out there again last year, uh, this last spring. Uh, we do that once every four years for the statewide uh, muskie program. And, you know, that went well. I think we, uh, we handled probably about 40 fish again, which is normal for us. And, uh, you know, our best day was, I think, right away when we got going, and then the weather started cooling off, so catch rates tailed. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, you know, it, as far it, as we can tell, everything's great. And, uh, you know, what, what we've been hearing from anglers is they're still seeing a lot of fish in the mid-30s and low-30s, which, that you know, those would be in that, you know, roughly four- or five-year-old range. So that's the, the ones that are coming up. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about your state task force that you're involved with. Uh, what's the purpose and, and what is it exactly? So the Walleye Technical <laughs> Committee was, uh, and, and we actually have these technical committees for uh, a, you know, all the major sport fish species in the state. So uh, I believe there's a catfish one, uh, the walleye one, the pike, uh, muskie, and bass, and I think panfish as well. So uh, the, those were formed, uh, almost all of them, back in about 2013 by uh, fisheries chief Dirk Peterson at that time. And the charge to the walleye technical committee, uh, one of our charges was to evaluate uh, the accelerated walleye program, and particularly uh, the higher fingling stocking densities, is dumping in more fish having the desired effect of increasing abundance and availability to anglers. Um, so we got started on that, uh, you know, probably by 2014, with uh, pulling data together 
uh, things like that. And that, that was a slow and painful process, which Dale Logsdon, which is a research co-chair on the committee, on the management co-chair, um, Dale did a lot of that leg heavy lifting in the background. And um, you got it to a point where we could look at it from a statewide, you know, broad statewide mm -hmm. perspective. And uh, the net change in gill net catch rates, just as the, the, the blunt metric, uh, the net change was zero. It was a perfect bell-shaped curve centered on zero. Hmm. So as many lakes had increased, you know, for the number of lakes that increased, we had pretty much the same number of lakes that decreased. Wow. And the bulk of them, 75% of them, were in that plus or minus three fish per net range, which depending on, you know, where your starting point is, that is or is not a meaningful number. So it was pretty obvious to us as a group uh, that the best way to tackle this was at the individual lake level. And uh, that's, you know, what I and Dale and then Dave Weitzel, who's not on the technical committee, but he's the area supervisor in Grand Rapids, um, we hashed out an Excel-based program where we can enter in our, our gillnet survey data. And, you know, this is where the us aging fish becomes very important because then we're able to compare your classes and, and you know, mm -hmm. the relative strength of them within that lake. Um, you know, we, we uh, drafted that program, uh, got that out in the hands of our areas for them to use, and that's the tool we're using to evaluate stocking in the state now. Um, so they, you know, put all the data in and they look at it. Recruitment is one of the big ones, you know. if. We deli we're stocking an individual year class with our stocking efforts. If it's working, then those stock year classes should be stronger than non-stock year classes or year classes that were stocked with something different, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, you basically, you look at it and say, well, are they, are they stronger or not? And then there's some, some uh, empirical methods to do the same thing, working with the average values and stuff like that. And... Um, so we so we rely on our recruitment patterns, our, our stock year classes or the year classes stocked at a higher rate, stronger than what they were otherwise. Um, we have our overall walleye gill net catch as an index of abundance. Um, we also include gr growth rates in that, walleye growth rates, um, because if we're overdoing it and, and food's becoming limiting, we'll see growth rates slow down. The reason that's important is, uh, you know, if it takes them an extra year because of that to reach the fishery, all natural mortality is always happening anyway. Mm -hmm. So whatever gains we might have had with the extra numbers, we end up losing over the course of that extra year just because of natural mortality alone. And, and it's also a pretty good indication if you're limiting forage for, for walleyes, uh, you're probably going to have the same effect on pike and some of the other predators in the system. Um, our perch catch rates are also a, a, a one we rely on in that method. Um, forage availability. Uh, when we have higher perch numbers, we tend to do better with walleye management and vice versa. So perch are a really important part of that equation. Um, so anyway, we got that in the hands of our area supervisors, and they already knew which, which lakes were getting stocked at a higher rate, which weren't, and um, you know, fed the data in, and they each made their own decisions and own conclusions on and, and interpretation on, keep on what the outcome was. <laughs> so. Um, you know, in summary, there's 254 lakes statewide that, that fit this uh, approach. And of those 254 lakes, about 70% of the time we failed to move the needle by dumping more really? fish in. Um, you know, 50% uh, of them, if I remember right, about 50% of them uh, were unchanged, and about another 20, 25% actually declined and went the wrong direction. So. In, in a lot of those lakes, we're simply going back down to our historical uh, half-pound uh, annual equivalent rate. So we're still stocking them. We're just not dumping in twice as many for the same outcome. Because it just didn't pay off. Yeah, it, it's, you know, the purpose of dumping fish in is to have more fish available. And then you did identify some lakes, too, I believe, where you're just not going to stock anymore. Yeah, that was only eight lakes total out of the whole group. <clears throat> and that was, those were lakes that uh, we've already tried fry. We've already tried fingerlings. We probably already tried fry at a high density, and that didn't work. And then the fingerlings at a high density also didn't work. You know, those are, you know, by and large, bass panfish lakes by design. Uh, you know, we managed to force walleyes in there for, you know, probably the past 30, 40 years. But it's, you know, with climate change and some of these other 
uh, changes that are happening is just not sustainable anymore. So, um, you, but you're also identifying some lakes, I believe, that you were going to maybe do more stocking because you think there will be a value to it? Yeah, there's a handful that were identified for, for increasing a little bit. That was, you know, maybe five lakes, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was uh, about another uh, 30% of lakes, probably 40% of lakes were, you know, no change. They felt it was uh, management objectives were being met, uh, so they left it alone. So it's pretty interesting that you're doing this as a statewide perspective. Probably it's never really been done before, has it? When you not at this level. Yeah. You know, we've we've had different studies. Uh, you know, Brad Parsons Fifty Lake study, for example, that was, um, you know, fifty lakes scattered around the state where you know they manipulated stocking densities and stuff like that, and, and looked at it with a under the microscope. This is a more broad approach, but it, it still drills down to the lake level. Um, you know, the, the increase in stock, uh, fingerling stocking density, that, was, that change was made statewide with a broad brush approach, and it didn't have uh, similar broad brush um, impacts, you know, at least in what we were looking for. Mm-hmm. So it did not make sense to, you know, equally, um, you know, make the same change going the other direction, particularly on those lakes where we did have success, and those are obviously going to be maintained. Now, when you do uh, research on the lakes, that data is available online. How do people get to that? Well, that's the lake survey data information. Uh, the report Dale and I, uh, the summary report we've we've pulled together, I don't think that's been made available yet. Not yet. I would expect that will probably be posted on the DNR website. Okay. So, good stuff. Interesting information. And as scientists, you're always trying to understand what's going on. And now climate change has thrown another little loop in there, making yep. it more complex. But really interesting information. And I, I go to those websites often to try to find out uh, what's going on on the lakes and uh, appreciate all the work that you guys do. It's a very, very challenging job. And, uh, yeah. But it's good information. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, <laughs> folks have a question about their specific lake, uh, just touch base with the area supervisor for that lake and, and have a good discussion like we did today. Right. Well, thanks for jumping on with us, Doug. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.